Bippity boppity boo. Hey, and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio, part two of this week's episode. And uh, thank you to Madison Rising. If you guys didn't know, if you weren't hip, the uh, intro music and the outro music that we use is from Madison Rising. It's from our buddies at Madison Rising. So uh, if you haven't checked those guys out yet, make sure that you do. It's it's what, Jared? It's real simple. It's MadisonRising.com, right? Yeah, MadisonRising.com. MadisonRising.com. They are a pro-Second Amendment, pro-liberty rock and roll band. You won't hear any of this hippie, liberal, left-wing horse crap coming out of those guys' mouths. All right. Oh, geez. Let's let's continue. We've got more stuff to talk about. But before we do, we want to say thank you to Colt, the makers of the LE-901 rifle, Colt Manufacturing. To excess sights, the fastest sights in any light. And we want to remind you about the uh, the SWAT fuel challenge. If you are taking SWAT fuel, if you're using SWAT fuel uh, uh, a- athletic supplements, I guess you could call them athletic supplements, and you don't have to be a professional athlete. Uh, our buddy Dr. Dan, he said that he actually designed SWAT fuel for the occupational athlete. And an occupational athlete would be a fireman, EMT, police officer, sheriff's deputy, United States Marine, soldier, sailor, stuff like that. People that actually, because of their job, have to be physically fit. And that's what SWAT fuel is for. Now, if you go to SWATfuel.com and you check out their uh, their list of products and you decide, hey, I'm going to go ahead and uh, buy one of these, you want to make sure that you use the uh, promo code SOTG, student of the gun, SOTG, 2014. Type in SOTG. 2014, and you'll get 20% off your total order. Now, we just keep, we can't stop giving you cool stuff and promo codes. And, you know, it pays to be a student of the gun. Does it not, Jared? Does it not, Jared? He's, he's giving me the finger. It, it does pay. I was giving him the finger. Not that finger. He's giving I, I me hit the... a, I hit one of the links, and it's an automatic video playing. I can't stand that because then it just starts... Oh, starts going and going and going, okay. and I got to figure out which tab it is. I got you. He's over there messing with show notes and stuff. And uh, but yeah, uh, don't forget the Brownells promo code because you are a student of the gun. You can use the promo code P E V or Papa Echo Victor. Uh, you want to use that between now and August thirtieth because if you do, you'll get ten dollars off your order of fifty dollars or more at Brownells dot com. So check that out. And if you're using SWAT fuel. Uh, jump in on our SWAT Fuel personal challenge. Post pictures uh, of yourself you know, working out or whatever and tag them, hashtag, that's the pound sign, old guys, uh, SWAT Fuel, S-W-A-T-F-U-E-L, and share those with us. We're going to be sharing our experiences with you guys and the rest of the Student of the Gun family. We're going to be sharing our experiences on social media. And if you don't like social media, that's cool, too. You can... Uh, you can write it in a paperback book. You can sit down and write the notes in the margin of your paperback book. Oh. Okay, Jared, you ready to get right into the meat of this week's uh, or this particular episode? Yeah, let's give them what they want. All right, let's give them what they want. You know they want the meat, so we're going to give it to them. Well, the story or the title of this uh, particular episode is Gun Control Works. And the reason that we're talking about this is because I actually just did an article the article's done, it's completed, and Jared's going to be releasing it in conjunction uh, with this radio episode this week. And essentially, uh, I was having a conversation with a colleague, and you know, we're having the reasonable guy, uh, you know, non-angry, logical conversation, the analytical conversation. And he said, you know, gun control laws, if you examine them from the outside, uh, you'll see that they don't work, that they're abject failures. That uh, I mean, whether it's Chicago or D.C. or New York City or the country of Australia or the country of uh, Great Britain, uh, United Kingdom, merry old England, whatever you want to call it, uh, wherever they institute strict gun control, gun registration, civilian disarmament programs, it never stops crime. It never makes crime go away or reduces violent crime. It only sh- it only kind of moves around a little bit. Uh, you know, and in England, uh, they like to point to the fact that uh, since the Gun Control Act of whatever, 
84, 87, 89. They've got a whole bunch of different gun control acts on the books over there in England that they haven't had one mass shooting since then. They haven't had one single mass shooting since then. No, they haven't. But they've had hundreds, thousands and thousands of single shootings, of home invasions, of beatings, of robberies, of rapes, of thefts, of, you know, violent assaults. They still have lots and lots of those, but they haven't had one. So, okay, so what you're telling me there is is it's, it's worth it to trade the loss of one single mass shooting for hundreds if not thousands of individual robberies and rapes and assaults and murders. So that's okay. If we kill the people one or two at a time, that's acceptable. If we kill them, you know, five, six, seven, ten, a dozen at a time, well, we, we can't have that. we got to kill people at a slower rate, and, and that's okay. So that justifies our gun control. Well, my, my friend, uh, my compatriot that I was talking to, he, he said, so how is it in the face of all this evidence to the contrary that gun control laws don't work, that they're failures, how is it that there are people in the United States, politicians, citizens, activist groups, that can still go out in public and scream for more gun control, more this, more that, you know, more restrictions. And I said, dude, you're missing the point. Gun control does work. It just doesn't work as it's advertised. When they're selling you the the ignorant masses, the skulls full of mush, when they're selling you gun control, they're not selling it to you as a way for the state to control the citizen. It's not, they're not selling it to you as a way to create a subservient peasant class. No, they sell it to you promising that violent crime will end and there will be no more violent crime or there will be less violent crime. And then, of course, what have we seen over the years? You know, after one year, two years, five years, ten years – and the violent crime rate hasn't gone down, well, what do they do? Do they admit failure? Do they come to you and say, you know what? We, you know, we, we promoted this gun control bill as the, uh, a way to, to stop crime, and it didn't happen. So it was a failure. We're going to take it off the books. Oh, <laughs> no, no, they don't. They don't ever do that. They don't ever say that was a failure. What they say is we need more of it. We need more gun control. And... This is what, how gun control works. What gun control does or gun restrictions or civilian disarmament or whatever you want to call it is it gives legal standing to the narrative that some guns are bad and that citizens need permission from the state to own them or that the state has the authority to disarm the citizen any time that it sees fit. Think about it like this. Uh, most of you, in the sound of my voice, most of you live, I would assume, in uh, in free America. You live in areas where you don't need to secure permission from the government uh, to buy a firearm. You don't need to get a, a special permission slip from the government to own or purchase a firearm. But there are places within the borders of the United States of America where they have convinced the people, they've convinced the citizens – that the government has the authority to either approve or deny the purchase of a gun. And I'm not talking about filling out a 4473, which is annoying and, and pointless and stupid, but I'm talking about areas like Boston or Massachusetts or New York or Illinois and Chicago, where it's not good enough to be a citizen of the state you have to become a registered gun owner. You have to get a special permission slip from the state giving you permission to purchase a gun. And they've done it enough that, that they've convinced the ignorant, the great unwashed masses, they've convinced them that that's the way it's supposed to be, that the government has the authority. And... Uh, well, not not just the citizens, but the uh, the employees of the state. And what we're going to see in the next uh, story that we talk about is that there are employees of the state that feel that they are somehow part of the ruling class and that they have the authority to either approve and or deny 
to citizens, not convicted felons, not people that are in, you know, that have already been disqualified. And there's there's tons of ways to disqualify someone or put them in what they call disability so that they can't purchase a firearm. Uh, we're talking about just regular people uh, who, for whatever reason, have been told, no, you are not allowed well, why? I, I'm not a convicted felon. I'm, uh, I, I am not on disability. I'm not a drug drug addict or, or what have you or mentally incompetent. No, we just decided that you don't. It kind of goes along the lines of discretionary carry. There's still lots of states in the United States of America that have on the books, technically they have concealed carry on the books, but it's discretionary, which means it's up to the state. And what the state normally does is they decide – well, we're going to put the uh, the authority to approve or deny concealed carry permits. We're going to put that in the hands of the either the state police or the the uh, the sheriff or the chief of police or whoever the the senior law enforcement officer is uh, in that uh, jurisdiction. So it falls upon the sheriff or the chief, and they can decide at their own discretion to just say no. You go to them and you say, well, I, I would like to, I want a concealed carry permit. First of all, you shouldn't have to do that anyway. And they just, and they say, uh, no. You say, well, well, no, hang on. Ah, the law says it's discretionary. So uh, if I don't like your purple sweater, then the answer is no, go away. And you have no recourse. And so what is, what do gun control laws do? Well, what they do is they give legal standing or legal affirmation to the fact that Citizens must request permission from the government to own a gun, to possess a gun, to purchase a gun. And not only that, but that – and what did we just learn this week uh, on episode 78? That now we have federal judges, we have sitting judges that have decided that it's not unconstitutional to deny the citizens the right to own certain kinds of guns. And that the state now has the authority to pick and choose – what kind of guns they're going to allow you, the peasant, to own. And when you talk to your fellow citizens, your coworkers, your, you know, like I said, your family, your Aunt Tilly and your, your cousin Susie and stuff, all these reasonable people that just don't understand why you think you need to have a gun. Or they, th- they think, well, it's just reasonable that the government – you know, should restrict certain kinds of guns from being owned by the citizens. Well, why is that? Well, because people can't be trusted. You mean you can't be trusted? Oh, no, no, you could trust me, but other people can't be trusted. Well, who can be trusted then? Oh, well, well, police officers. So the state, the government can be trusted to own the guns. And remember this, Each and every time a firearms bill is passed, a gun control, gun restriction bill is passed, what is the first thing that they do? What's the first language that they put into it? Except for the state. Except for the state. Yep. Oh, the following guns are hereby unlawful and illegal, and you're not allowed to own them unless you work for the government. And then it's okay. So... In fact, those those laws are lies. If you really want to be honest, let's be honest with ourselves. Let's let's be intellectually honest. If your local representative comes to you and says the AR-15 is just too dangerous of a gun to be allowed, we can't risk those being out there. So we're going to pass a law that makes it illegal to own them. Illegal for everyone in the state to own? Well, no. No, not illegal for everyone in the state, just for you. Well, why just for me? Why not for everyone? And what they won't say, but what they mean is because you're a second-class citizen, you are a peasant. You're part of the peasant class. We're part of the ruling class, and it's okay for the ruling class to have those things. But you peasants need to just shut up. And what is really the most sinister part about gun control laws it's not even it doesn't even have anything to do with the hardware it has to do with the fact that what you do is you convince people over time you convince the citizen that they are in fact by law subservient 
that they are in fact by law second class or uh, peasant class. Because, well, you're like, well, that's bull crap, Paul. That's not true at all. How is it not true? You tell them, you, great unwashed masses. And what they won't ever say is they won't say you. They'll say, well, the criminal element. Hey, dumbass. The criminal element, what have we seen historically? They will always have their guns. They will always find a way. Um, didn't Wasn't there a story that popped up about uh, some some uh, gun manufacturing black market in Australia recently? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, we've, we've got a, uh, a listener that writes in from Australia, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to. Give, take you through what he had to go through to get a gun, a, a handgun. Uh, it says, blah, blah, blah. He says, I finally got my handgun just for target shooting. So that was 14 months of paperwork, training, five background checks, and a police inspection of my safe. And you'd say, okay, he's probably got like a G18 fully automatic handgun or something, right? Yeah, he's got something serious, some kind of serious, crazy hardware to go through all that to get permission. What is yeah, it, Jared? It, it's a uh, Walther SSP-22. So 14 <laughs> months of paperwork, five background checks, a, an inspection by the police of his safe in order to have a twenty two pistol. Yeah. So this this law abiding citizen here has a twenty two pistol now. When in over that fourteen month period, uh, how many automatic rifles did these other the black market manufacture? Yeah, they were. Uh, there was a news story where they were just freaking down there in Australia. We and we we highlighted it here on Student of the Gun uh, about these illicitly and illegally manufactured submachine guns, and they were freaking because these things were out there. Uh, it's basic mechanics. It does not take a genius to put together something that goes bang. We've been doing it for hundreds of years. It's pretty basic. In World War II, they were manufacturing submachine guns. I think the original, it's something crazy, like the original uh, Sten was like 18 bucks to manufacture, and they were making them in bicycle shops. Uh, we figured out, as the human animal has figured out how to manufacture, how to produce firearms. And the fact is, is most of them, they don't have to do it anyway. They just steal them. They, they're like, well, if only the state can have guns, then, then then only the cops will have them. So you can't steal them. Really? They, they can't steal guns from the police? So there, there are no corrupt uh, police officers or politicians. Well, even if there weren't, didn't uh, we just see a story where – the uh, the Justice Department had how many guns missing? They did an audit, and it was in the thousands. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, I mean, besides the Fast and Furious guns that they just forgot where they went, and they're like, "Oops, can't find those thousands of guns." No, they had service weapons. It was something like eighty some service weapons were unaccounted for. Oops. So uh, the guns are always going to be out there, but what you do by instituting gun control laws is you create the narrative, you follow the narrative that some guns are good, some guns are bad, and that you need to get permission from the government. And that's just reasonable, and it's lawful. I mean, that's that's part of the law. And, there, and we're going to go ahead and jump into some hardcore slave state news here, and Jared's going to lead us in with our slave state update. I'd like to teach you all the rules. I get to see them set in stone. Now, we set this up last week. Was it last week or the week before? Um, about basically Boston tax slaves uh, and need permission. And uh, what we had leading up to this current story is, is we had the uh, a lot of the police administrators up there in the People's Republic of Massachusetts, led by the police commissioner of Boston, who just had just had a hissy fit. They were just having kittens. They were peeing down their legs because the legislation that was being bandied about between the House and the Senate up there in Massachusetts, that it had been changed. And uh, one of the houses, I can't remember if it was the House or the Senate, one of those bodies had changed the language of the bill so that the peasants in Massachusetts were not going to have to seek permission from the police in order to purchase a rifle or a shotgun. And that's, uh, as you guys know, that's when our, our buddy, what's what's that douche nozzle son of a gun's name up there? 
Jay Nixon? Uh, no, no. no wow. Nick, Jay Nixon is the scumbag um, governor of Massachusetts. Or, oh, that's right. Or, of, uh, I'm sorry, not Massachusetts, Missouri. Yeah. yeah. Um, Whatever the tool's name was. And uh, so they they threw a hissy fit. They all got together and they stood on the steps and they wore their uniforms. Uh, the uniforms that were bought and paid for by you, the... Uh, the slave taxpayers uh, of uh, the, the comfortable tax slaves of Massachusetts. And they threw a fit, and that's when he, he went on. Uh, find this that douche nozzle's name for me while I'm yakking here. And uh, he actually went on a radio show to say that the people of the city, meaning Boston, had no reason to own or they did not need to own shotguns, and they did not need to own them, meaning rifles or something like that. So essentially what you have is you have a, a, a police commissioner in the city of Boston who feels that uh, he's part of the ruling class and that the people that wear his uniforms are part of the ruling class, and they can have them. William Evans? Is, is that it? Uh, I don't, Come on, Jared. You've got to help me out that's here, That's what brother. it says in the show notes. Well, Boston Police Commissioner William Evans. Okay, Boston Police Commissioner William Evans. There you go. Uh, Patrick is the name of the of the uh, Deval Patrick is the is the slave master up there in the People's Republic of Massachusetts, who's decided that the slaves are no longer the slaves and peasants can no longer uh, purchase uh, firearms without the approval of the state. Anyway, so your your Boston cops all threw a freaking fit. They all uh, they threw a, they threw a little hissy fit. So uh, they went, they did some backroom deals, and they pushed this bill out. And the bill now uh, essentially says that in order t- to be a uh, a tax slave in the People's Republic of Massachusetts, uh, it says, uh, here's the title of the story, and this is from puke.puke.news. Uh, we're not going to give them any, uh, I'm sorry, if you really want to know, look in the show notes. But it's a Massachusetts governor signs law tightening state gun rules. Well, what rules? I mean, come on. It, it's the People's Republic already. I mean, how much more do they need? Uh, opening uh, opening paragraph. Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick has signed into law a measure giving police chiefs authority to turn down a resident's request to buy a rifle or a shotgun if they believe a person may be a danger. Now, hang on a second. If they believe that, based upon what? Based upon the fact that the person's a convicted felon? Well, no, just because they don't want to. So the slaves have to go up there and they have to say, Mother, may I, can I please have a permission slip to buy a gun, to buy a very limited number of guns? Because we already know that up there in the People's Republic that you can only own certain kinds of guns in certain configurations and that most of the firearms that we own down here in free America are illegal in the People's Republic of Massachusetts. So it's not good enough. Remember what we said, there's never enough gun control, and they will never, ever, ever be satisfied. It wasn't good enough for them to rush through emergency legislation to ban and prohibit the ownership of AR-15s and AKs and and all that jazz. No, 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 that was not anywhere near good enough. Ah, here we go. Here is the big lie. This is the lie that these elitist politicians tie themselves to. This is a quote from uh, Mr. Patrick. It says, our communities and our families are safer when irresponsible gun sales and use are reduced. This legislation moves us in that direction. Hey, Duvall, you're a piece of crap. You are one of the worst type of elitist puke face scumbags. You are you are part of what's wrong with this country. You feel that you've been given the authority, and apparently you have by the comfortable slaves up there in Massachusetts, to decide which of the peasants may or may not possess arms and which types of arms the peasants may or may not possess. You're a liar, you're disingenuous, and it's crap. And we know that this kind of crap goes on. Our communities and families are safer. No, they're not. You're a liar. And you know that you're lying. And this is what makes me upset about this, Jared. Can you tell? Is that 
when these puke faced scumbags go out in public and say things like this, they know they're lying. They know that gun control does not reduce violent crime. They know that these laws don't stop thugs and murderers and rapists and terrorists. Are we going to ban pressure cookers there, Duvall? What doesn't do any good to ban pressure cookers when we're just going to let known terrorists back into the country, but that's a topic for another day. So let's talk about terrorism. Let's talk about your people up there, Duvall. Let's talk about agents of the state that after a terrorist act, which I'm sorry, is the fault of the state because those two scumbags should have never been allowed to come in here on student visas. Let's go ahead and follow that up. So after two bad people do a bombing, what you're going to do is you're going to send out hundreds, if not thousands, of your state thugs armed with the same evil black rifles that you say the peasants are forbidden to have because they're too dangerous. And what did Kathy Blake tell us last week, Jared? What are AR-15s? They're no good for defense, right? They're only good for what? Offense. According to Kathy Blake up there in Maryland, the AR-15 is not suitable for defensive purposes, that it is a weapon of offense. So following Kathy's lead, Duvall, you sent out thousands of your state stormtroopers armed with evil black rifles that the peasants are forbidden to own and what we know Kathy Bates says are offensive weapons to violate the Constitution by conducting hundreds, if not thousands, of warrantless searches based on your discussion or or your to say of uh, an, an emergency or a crisis. The peasants don't have constitutional protection. Apparently, Only the elitist ruling class can hide behind the Constitution when they feel it's convenient. It's crap, and you people need to get your heads out of your butts and realize it. What's next? Um, Let me look real quick. Oh, here we go. We got got a – go ahead. I'm going to hit up on this one, tyranny on display. And what have we told you guys over and over and over again? What have I said? And I've told you guys this, you know – when there's a bad shooting, when there's, you know, when uh, New York NYPD decides you shouldn't have ought to been there and, you know, tough noogies for you, we shot you. Uh, you know, you innocent bystanders shouldn't have been standing around. All of you reasonable people out there, and I hear you, and you write comments on Facebook and so forth, and you say things like this. Oh, well, yeah, I know that those two, three, four, ten innocent people were shot. For no reason other than NYPD is not really good at marksmanship. Um, We know that they were shot by the police, but they're going to get paid. Oh, yeah, they're going to have a payday. And what have we pointed out? That no, they're not. What happens is when the NYPD or others, when they ventilate citizens accidentally, negligently, they negligently shoot citizens, what what do they do? They they circle the wagons, and they get the local DA, they get the local uh, uh, district attorneys and so forth. They get them all involved, and they push and they stall out on any payments. And then if the victims of the negligent shootings try to sue, then what you've got is you've got the city attorneys. They'll go in and they'll file motions, and they'll file stays, and then they keep doing it until they get a sympathetic court. And we've seen over and over again courts – affirming that, court saying that they're not responsible and that they don't have to pay out. So all you guys out there who keep knee-jerking that old same tired music about, oh, well, yeah, I know it sucks that the police accidentally shot you, but but it's going to be cool because, man, they're going to write you a big fat check. Guess what? Not in America today they're not. They're not going to write you a big fat nothing. They're going to say you shouldn't have been standing where the bullets were. And what we have here is we got a story that comes from us from personalliberty.com, and this is Dateline, August 14th, 2014. Officials, it's objectively reasonable, in quotes, for cops to terrorize innocent citizens. You're like, Paul, what are you talking about? A lawsuit filed by an Indiana resident who was a victim of a botched SWAT raid, SWAT raid is being challenged by local authorities on the grounds that it is, quote, 
objectively reasonable for law enforcement officials to carry out danger or potentially deadly operations based on faulty intelligence. You're like, what? Well, what went down? On June 21st, 2012, over two years ago, police in Evansville, Indiana, shattered the glass door of a 68-year-old Louise Milan's home, tossed in flashbang grenades, stormed the residence, terrorized the elderly woman and her 18-year-old adopted daughter. Officers smashed Milan's windows and storm doors, threw in flashbangs, created damage, uh, and then destroyed a storm door. Then they brought them out in handcuffs at gunpoint in front of their neighbors. Oh, and guess what? Oops. Oops. Sorry. And what was uh, Ms. Milan's crime here? Her crime was not was having an unsecured Wi-Fi router. So a local gangbanger had apparently parked next to or was or was living close enough to Milan's house to feed or tap off of her signal and posted some kind of threats against the Evansville PD. So what do they do? They go, now, hang on a second, Jared. Um, well, I don't know. I, I'd have to see what these threats were, but uh, were these threats enough to justify? And did they not know who lived in this house? They just got an address, and they're like, hey, we got an address. Well, who lives there? I don't know. But we're smashing the doors in tonight. Anybody who's inside is going to be made to pay. So they didn't do any kind of intel. They didn't surveil the place. They didn't decide, well, this 68-year-old woman and her 18-year-old adopted daughter are probably not responsible for making threats against the police department. No, apparently they didn't do that. And you say, well, this lady's going to get paid, right? No, no, because... They're fighting the lawsuit, and their statement is, listen to this. I'm going to go ahead and give you, uh, there's a statement from the city's attorney. Uh, Here we go. The Evansville Courier explains why. It says, city attorneys Kevin uh, Vonderock and Robert Burkhart argued in a motion that police are protected by the legal principle of qualified immunity. In it, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that, quote, Government officials performing discretionary functions generally are shielded from liability for civil damages as long as their conduct does not clearly violate an established statute or constitutional right. There you go, folks. It's okay. And don't ever think that they're going to say, sorry, our bad, let us make it right. No, they're going to drag you, the victim, through the through the uh, the court system, they're going to bankrupt you because they're spending tax money, and uh, they'll just drag it out and drag it out and drag it out until they find a friendly court, and then it just sucks to be you. I guess you shouldn't have been there. Uh, you want to know some good news here? Let's talk about some good news. Yeah, let's talk about some uh, pro gun good news. Here. All right, we're gonna we're gonna end this on an up note. All right, we're gonna end this on an up note. And uh, we haven't talked about uh, our friend Nanny Bloomberg in a while, uh, other than than to point out his complete and total hypocrisy here recently. But uh, and this is this story actually. I heard this on on a Glenn Beck show on his morning show. He actually had the sheriff in question here. Uh, he had the sheriff on his show and he interviewed him. And uh, there is a pro gun pro uh, pro gun rights sheriff's candidate up in Milwaukee County, up in Wisconsin there. And uh, apparently, if you're pro-rights, if you're pro-constitution, uh, pro-anything as far as uh, as the rights of the citizen, then we can't have that. And Nanny Bloomberg sure can't have that. So what you've got is you've got a uh, a local election for a sheriff. Now, how much, Jared, how much money do you think you've got a local sheriff's department election, a, a primary election? How much money do you think – that a local sheriff's candidate is going to spend on advertising. A couple grand maybe. A few grand, you know, 10 grand probably be a lot. Because, you know, most of these sheriffs, you know, I know, I don't know what this guy makes, but, you know, most of them make in the neighborhood uh, somewhere between, you know, well, I don't know, it used to be like 40000 in Holmes County. They made $40,000 or something. And, but uh, let's say fifty, sixty, maybe even $75,000 a year. 
So you're not going to put, you know, you don't spend $75,000 to get a job that pays you $75,000. Well, uh, Nanny Bloomberg and his ilk, his PACs, his super PACs, you know, the the moms against and the, the idiots for reasonable gun control and all that jazz, they spent $150,000 to try and convince the people of Milwaukee County to not vote for this guy. And why is that? Why is that, Jared? Because he's an evil, bad person and he shouldn't have any authority? No, because he's pro-gun. He thinks that the, that the Constitution actually means something. And let me tell you what kind of a racist Nanny Bloomberg is. Uh, David Clark Jr., the Milwaukee County Sheriff, uh, is a man of color. So you have your rich white man. How's that for a reverse racism there, Jared? Yeah, he's trying to oppress the, the, the black you man. you got a rich white man in the form of Nanny Bloomberg funneling tons of money to try and defeat a man of color here in uh, Milwaukee County. Uh, what does that tell you? Well, first of all, it tells you that liberalism is a mental disease. And uh, on the altar of liberalism, if you guys don't know this by now, you should. All things are sacrificed on the altar of liberalism. Let's, and what do you mean, Paul? Well, let me see. Bill Clinton was one of the biggest scumbags, one of the biggest womanizers, one of the biggest uh, abusers of women to ever occupy the Oval Office. And yet the uh, National Organization of Witches, NOW, uh, they never left his side. They made excuses for him the whole time. Uh, but And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. If they're really for women and women's rights, then they wouldn't. Uh, they wouldn't support somebody that abuses women and uses them like, you know, Kleenex. No, because all things are sacrificed on the altar of liberalism. And we thought you guys would appreciate that. We thought you'd appreciate a kind of a go team moment here. Uh, despite pumping, you know, mil- not millions, but uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars into an effort to try and defeat him, he won. And uh, it's his... Uh, uh, Clark said uh, Mayor Bloomberg made a huge miscalculation. He didn't understand the political climate on the ground here in Milwaukee County. He says, I have a lot of support for my position on the support of the Second Amendment for the people to be able to defend themselves and for the pro-gun movement. And we say to that, amen, brother. It's like uh, James Craig up there in Detroit, the chief of police in Detroit, we say amen, James Craig. And it's a good thing that, you know, it, that uh, Chief Craig up there, that he's not elected, that he's been hired, because you know that if uh, Chief Craig was up for re-election, that Nanny would be trying to get him kicked out. So what else we got, Jared? We uh, we just about to that time? Yeah, we're coming up on the end here. We're okay. Almost to 40 minutes. All right. Well, we want to let you guys know, or we want to remind you, and we talked about this during the uh, first hour, but we're going to go ahead and hit on it again in the second hour. Uh, thank you again for listening to Student of the Gun Radio. We appreciate you guys being out there. And uh, as you guys should know by now, uh, we've announced that we've got a bonus third hour. About a month or two ago, I guess it was a couple of months ago, we started the uh, the venture into uh, direct streaming media. Uh, that's really the wave of the future. Uh, the We've had our Armed Living DVD, Armed Living uh, Concealed Carry in an Uncertain World, that as a physical DVD, it's been available for about two years now, right, Jared? I guess about two years. And But let's face it, folks. When's the last time you actually went into a store and purchased or rented a DVD? Most of you probably don't. I know some of you old hardcore dudes are like, that's all I do is DVDs. I don't do that electronic. Okay, I got you. But let's face facts. You're listening to me electronically. You're listening to me via some type of a mobile device. And the wave of the future, the future of media is on demand. And we're trying to work and, you know, kind of deal with yesterday while moving into tomorrow. And so what Jared did is he took the Armed Living DVD and he made it available for direct down or direct streaming. And uh, if you go to uh, studentofthegunradio.com, uh, there's a direct link right there for the third hour. You go, we have a, a what's called Gumroad. 
those of you who aren't into the the digital media thing probably never heard of it but what they do is they allow you the they give you the avenue to provide your audience with direct streaming material and we can do it with audio and we can do it with video and we can send you special pdf files like the book and so the first thing first product that we launched was the armed living dvd for direct stream you can download it uh, not down. Well, I say the word download. You you basically pay for it. It gives you the code, and uh, you can start watching it. Bam! Just like watching a movie on Netflix. You guys watch movies on Netflix. You watch movies on Hulu uh, or Xbox Video or whatever. Well, you have a choice there. You can either purchase it or you can direct stream it. And most of you guys know that if you purchase it, it takes a long, long time to for that high you know, that video or that movie to download and to save. But if you direct stream it, you just pay for it, you watch it, and it's good to go. And that's exactly what we've done. So now you can direct stream the Arm Living DVD without having to, uh, you know, wait for it to be shipped to you or what have you. Well, in addition to that, we started offering the bonus third hour of Student of the Gun Radio. And it's only available to you guys who subscribe because, uh, quite frankly, Paul gets off the chain a little bit harder. Or I go a little bit farther off the chain. And, hey, you're probably thinking, what? He gets farther off the chain? Jared, do I get farther off the chain? Yeah, he gets a little bit extra slack. <laughs> In the bonus third hour. And because we appreciate you guys, uh, what we've done, what have we done so far for him, Jared? We gave him the, we've given him the bo- a couple of bonus reports. We did a bonus uh, cover versus concealment PDF instructional, uh, kind of a document there, a special report. We gave them a special audio version last week, right? Yeah, we did the special audio version last week, a, a bonus audio. And what we've decided between Jared and I is that here's what we're going to do for you guys for a limited time, for 30 days. Anybody who signs up for the bonus third hour via Gumroad, you sign up. You get the extra hour, you get the uh, the off-the-chain version of Student of the Gun Radio. What we're going to do is we're going to give you a complimentary copy of the Student of the Gun book. Student of the Gun, a beginner wants a student for life. We're going to send that to you because you're a smart, hip dude uh, or dudette via the e-book, and you're going to get that immediately. And, what, Jared, what did you decide you were going to do? You were going to go ahead and... uh, Give it to every, give, give it, it to everybody that is already. Yeah, and if subscribed. you've already subscribed, we're going to give that to you too. So how cool is that? That's pretty cool. So if, if you just go to studentofthegunradio.com, dot com, and it'll have uh, in the on the top right, right above the midway banner, it'll say subscribe to the third hour. Click here. So click the little blue link, and then and then you can uh, subscribe to the third hour there. All right, and so, and what I'm going to I'm going to tease you guys with is coming up in the bonus third hour, the one that only subscribers can hear. In the bonus third hour, we're going to talk about slavery enablers. Uh, we're going to return to the Patriot Bookshelf. We're going to uh, discuss that a little bit, and then I've got a quote from you guys from John Steinbeck that you're absolutely not going to want to miss if you're a dedicated student of the gun. Don't forget about Student of the Gun TV. Uh, You can watch it every Monday night at 9 Eastern on Dish 266. Make sure you're doing that. Or on Roku or Apple TV. Uh, Don't forget about the mobile app, the Student of the Gun mobile app, available for all iDevices, iPhones, iPads, iWhatevers, and uh, your smartphone. You go to Google Play, and you can download it for free thanks to our friends at Century Arms. Okay, ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, do not forget... You are a beginner once, but you should indeed be a student for life. 